morning and welcome back to another video with me uh, Ginger GM Simon Williams now I've been away for a little bit and well let me just you know go into where the hell I've been in a second and I'm going to show you some quite cool pictures from where I've been have a little talk about life etc etc now if you can't be asked with any of that rubbish um, look at where I the game analysis actually starts because I'm going to look at one of my games from this recent European Club Cup team competition thingy majiggy and you can jump forwards in this video to that starting point if you just want to see the chess and you don't want to hear any of my random rubbish I'm, I'm going to go into now but if you want to hear some random rubbish and you come to the right place um, so I've been away with Team Cheddleton to Serbia, to Novi Sad, it's the third time I've been to this place, competing in the European Club Cup. Um, and, well, I'm sure most of you know Fiona, who I do a lot of streams with. She's, she was our captain, um, fabulous captain. She, she must be thanked massively for all the effort she did to get our team together. I'm going to come to photos soon of some of our encounters. And um, we had on our boards, we had David Howe, one of England's best players, and he will be over 2,700 in, in no time on board two. Vlad on board three, a very good friend of ours who comes to England regularly, originally from Moldova, extremely strong player on board two. I was perking things up on board three. The famous Eggy 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 on board four. Tabas from Hungary, who lives in London, on board five. And on board six, Fiona. So it was a great team and it was a great event. Now, you know, we did party a little bit too hard. I'm going to, you know, admit that. Uh, we also played some hard chess as well. You know, we worked hard and played hard. Um, and the game I'm going to show you, which I'm going to come up to, was against a very strong Romanian Grandmaster, about 2550, and I had the white pieces. And there's a bit of a story behind this. Now, we were meeting up quite regularly in an Irish bar called the Red Cow in um, Novi Sad, and we'd often meet with some of the Irish players. So let me just bring up, I have to say, quite a bad picture, and this is taken from the Irish Union chess site. I hope I don't get sued for using this picture. If I do, hey ho, hey hum. And we met up with the two guys on the right hand side there, Carl and Killian, two of the nicest guys in Irish chess there. They're right on the right hand side of that picture. And they were telling me down the Irish pub before this game was played about the Kilkenny Gambit. And they had the charm of the Irish. They had the charm of the Irish. They they convinced me it was it was basically the best opening that man that God had ever given to man, and they used they worked that Irish charm on me, and I promised them that I'd play the gambit in in the next day if my opponent played knight f6, and I sat at the board. We'll come to that a bit later on. I ended up playing it, and it was a very exciting game. We'll come to that later on. Now I should also mention, uh, you know, in this picture, this rather young young guy there in the yellow jacket, who's Henry Lee who had a phenomenal tournament, and this kid is going to be a great player. He's only a kid, only about 14, 15 years old, and he was playing for the international master norm in his last round, and I wish him the best of luck for the future, so good luck, Henry. So I have to say, you know, when I came to playing this game, I, it, would, it was a mixture of either being a bit of a clown if I didn't pull it off, and you can see me in a clown gear in a picture below, or a bit of a legend. There you go, me cruising along with a beer and a top picture. So this was the thing. If I pulled it off and I won, I would have been a bit of a legend. And, well, I won't give the result away, a clown, if I'd lost. So there was quite a lot riding on it. Um, now, before I talk more about that game, let's show you some of the pictures. Because I know a lot of you guys on my YouTube channel here supported us, donated money to help us make this tournament happen. And I'm going to repay that by showing you videos of some of the most exciting games we had there. But thank you so much. So let's go for some of these pictures. And these pictures are taken from Fiona's Facebook page. Go and check it out. You can search her name, Fiona Stila Alnatoni. And uh, she'll probably kill me for saying that wrong, but I know her first name is Fiona, and that's a damn good start. And let's have a look at some of the pictures. So this is picture number one. And we have in the top left-hand 
picture there. Eggy, me and David at the airport. David doing his blue steel look. And then you see us lining up at the chessboard. Fiona wearing her thinking hat there. She had a lot of complaints about that hat in the bottom left-hand corner. But it was quite a cool fashion statement that summed up our team. And then in the right bottom-hand corner, that is Vlad, the legendary Vlad, Fiona and Lennart. Lennart does a lot of pictures. He's a great photographer, been a long-term friend of ours for ages. Let me show you some more pictures. God, this is like a family album, isn't it? You know, we've been on a holiday. I'm showing you my holiday snaps. That's why I did say you can fast forward if you want to. In the next picture, well, there's three pictures of us there lining up, ready to play. And you can see most of the team in the top left. And then the top three boards in the top right, me covering my mouth. David leading the troops in the bottom left, playing a very talented Jordan Van Forest there, which was a great victory for him. And Vlad... Halfway through his game there, got a little bit bored and had a puff on a hubbly bubbly because it helps his style. So, well done, Vlad, for getting away with that and not getting the team thrown out. Now, in the next picture, we have, again, this is, um, again, one more picture of us sitting at the board. Fiona with a lovely smile there. You can see Thomas, Eggy, and, well, the whole team's there. And in the evening, we had a meal there, and this was before we played one of the big teams, doing a bit of a team chat about what we should do and things, and uh, we found a very nice restaurant um, in Novi Sad. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's really, to start with, um, the main pictures I just wanted to share with you, because I know a lot of you are interested in what happened over there and things. And we had a great time. We all pulled together as a team. I have to be honest, I think we're all a bit disappointed with our performance even though we came 21st which is fine we were hoping for a lot more than that and uh, I didn't have the best of tournaments things didn't go my way some of the other guys didn't as well so we had a great team spirit but we're all a little bit disappointed that we didn't do a bit better than where we came um so before we go over to that um I have to say I've been recovering from all this chess and this is kind of how I felt over the last couple of days I've been in this world here and I must thank Christoph for this brilliant photo there this chess psychedelic um I don't know what it is but it's pretty scary isn't it I mean that certainly has traits of Salvador Dali I mean I have to say bloody good show Christoph and is that me or was that me in the in the third dimension yeah you know what I mean okay so we'll come to the game very shortly now this gambit I was told about, um, which is a funny story behind it, and it's, I like I mentioned, was told to me by the two Irish guys, Cole and Killian, in the bar the night before, and I promised to play it. I'm a man of my word, I had to stick to my word. It was actually quite bad that after the game, I went up to them, I said, well, I had to play it, and they said, no, you didn't have to play it. Of course you didn't have to play it, you lunatic. You could have played anything else. And that's a very bad Irish accent, so I kind of like, uh oh, but well, you know, maybe I won. Let's see. And um, it was also the funniest thing was, and this was really stupidity on my part. The team we were playing with Never Ditchy, Never Never Ditchy here, Nitchy, should I say? They were a great player from Romania. The Irish guys played them in the round before this, and both Killian and Carl both played the same gambit against the team. So it wasn't a complete surprise to them. They were actually prepared for it as well. So I'm really just trying to put myself on the on the shooting mark here, aren't I, with this crazy gambit. But I think it's not so bad. And it might be an interesting opening for some of you guys to try out, have a bit of fun with, experiment with. It's been named the Kilkenny Gambit after one of the best chess tournaments in Ireland and the only chess tournament I haven't been to. So how do I know it's the best? Because everyone tells me it's one of the best. And it was the, all the rage, this gambit in Kilkenny. And people like Gwen Jones were giving it a thumbs up. Bogdan Lalich, who's a theory expert, all said, well, this is interesting. And it's a bit of a weird opening. I don't know if it has a proper opening, but for the time being, I think the Kilkenny gambit seems very appropriate. Okay, um, now let's move over. Well, one more thing I should say, there's a chess base sale. I've got to get a little bit of a plug in today. And if you if you haven't got some of my chess base DVDs, God, this is a bloody long introduction. I do apologize for this, but you know, it, I've been away for a while, so I'm making up for some lost time here. And now I'm doing my sales pitch. I'm, I've learned a bit from the Irish about this sales pitch. 
I mean, I, I wish I could do an Irish accent. It would improve my sales pitch no end. And um, if you go to, there's a link there. You can pause the video now if you want to. There's a link there where it has all my DVDs that I've done for Chess Base, and there's 25% off. And I think I've done some corking DVDs. Obviously, every DVD I do, I attempt to make as excellent as I possibly can. And you can see that I have 10 DVDs in the shop there. And they're all going for 50% off. And you can check out my little videos, free videos there as well. And you have a link there if you're interested in, in, in some of my things. And only today, 25% off. So you might find yourself an interesting little bargain there, you know, for, for yourselves. Okay, now I think I've got through all the formalities. And it's time to come to the crazy teas. And um, so what is this gambit? Over to the chess. Well, I was white and I played d4. Now, I didn't do any prep for this game because I didn't see any point. Um, now, the one thing I was hoping, I'll be honest here, I was praying my opponent would not play the move where I had to play the gambit. Just because, I, I don't know, I was scared. I was scared for the first time. But he did. My opponent played knight to f6. And now I sat here for five minutes and I thought, I promise the Irish and an Irish to the promise is a promise you have to save. And here we go with a Kill Kenny Gambit. Have you ever seen anything quite as mad as this? G4. Gary sacrifices himself for the centre. Goodbye, Gary. Salute to you as you go into the wilderness. Goodbye, my dear soldier. And, well, I mean, obviously, if Black doesn't take this pawn, Gary survives the fight another day. He charges on, gets into the attack... And he can have a big smile on his face because he hasn't lost his life. The only way to refute a gambit is to accept it. Knight takes g4 and it is a pawn. And what is the point of this gambit? The point is to go e4. And you get two pawns in the centre. You uh, attack the black knight. And you gain a little bit of time. So it has some positives. Now, I think there's not as bad as reputation this gambit. My opponent, though, because he'd had it the day before, clever preparation, Simon, had actually prepared the one line which in the bar the night before, the Irish guys were telling me was the one line I had to be careful of. But they also said, oh, no, don't worry, he won't play that. No one plays that line. No one plays it. No, he, no one will play that line. How are they going to find that line over the board? And um, <laughs> and I'm like, okay, okay, I, I trust you. Um, no, they weren't really. I'm only joking, just jesting. And the line was here, where well, you've got to guard the knight. If the knight goes back, let's have a look a little bit. Well, here you can just break on through to the other side and keep pushing e5. And you get loads of play here. Knight to somewhere like d here, and you go c4, and you're a tempo up in an alakine. And the alakine is a pretty crap opening anyway, so this is a good way. This has got to be worth a pawn. Now, if black goes d6, well, you play this like a perk. And I was actually going to play a move like knight to c3 and knight to f3 here. And you play it a bit like Shearoff's Gambit in the perk. Let me just show you what that is. Shearoff's Gambit in the perk goes e4, d6, d4, knight here, here, and now let's say e5, knight f3, knight d7. And here, g4 in this position has become a main theoretical recommendation. And it's a very dangerous move. So, you know, this is what this is actually, you know, not so bad. If d6, you get a similar position to that. So really, that leaves one logical move, d5. And here they convince me that bishop e2 is the best move. And I, I totally agree with Killian and Carl that it is. You develop a piece. You force the knight to make a decision. And now black has to decide what he's going to do. And Carl was telling me that in his game from the previous day, his opponent went knight f6. He went e5, his opponent went knight d7, and he went e6, sacrificing a second pawn. And in this position, I believe that white has fantastic compensation. I mean, you've even got cheeky ideas here, like queen d3, and if black falls asleep and plays c5, it's checkmate in a couple of moves. Crash, bang, wallet, put that in your pipe and smoke it. How? Well, bishop h5 check, g6. And if you want to really be a flash Harry, and who doesn't want to be a flash Harry because he's our best friend, queen takes g6 leads to mate. 
So all this looks pretty cool. You can see why I was getting quite convinced. But the one move they said to worry about was h5. What did my opponent play? h5. And he played it quickly. Thank you very much, opponent. He is a strong grandmaster. And this supports the knight on g4. And it makes it a little bit uncomfortable for me to work out what to do here. Because if I go h3, I was even thinking here he might go knight f6. And if e5, knight e4. And this looks stronger for my opponent now. I don't know, something like this scared me. I mean, I, I was again following what the, the lads had told me the night before. And I have to say, they, I think they got the right idea. And they, they, I mean, they were very convincing. I think this opening is not a bad. And they told me here, so I played it quickly and confidently, that you should take on d5. Normally when you gambit, you should open up the position, go for quick development. So I think this is the right approach. Black played queen takes d5, and now knight to f3. And here we have a weird Scandinavian. It's a Scandinavian with a lot of chaos on the king side. I've lost my g-pawn, but black has played h5 and knight g4. What's going on with these kind of moves? I've also gained a tempo somewhere. Well, I think the point is that he doesn't really want to play h5 because he'll find it hard to castle king side especially as I've got an open G line. His knight is quite well placed, I have to say. It's a bit annoying. So I would say that black probably has some edge, but white has, I think, also decent compensation for a pawn. And we're going to see this over the next couple of moves. I was very happy with the way the game developed. C6. And this stops ideas of me jumping with my knight to somewhere like B5, which would be very annoying for him. So I spent a bit of time here wondering if I should go c4 or just develop and I think I picked the right plan. Knight c3, quick development, attacking the queen, forcing it to move and of course when you sacrifice pawns remember timing is key. If you're giving up pawns it's all about gaining the initiative no matter what kind of gambit you play it's often often about all about time, bringing your pieces out with time, with speed, trying to prove your compensation in this way. And this is one move that does that. Now my opponent maybe should move his queen back here straight away. But he played queen a5, pinning my knight to my king. Standard move in the Scandinavian. I fought for a long time here and I thought, well, I'll put my pieces on the most aggressive squares. So my bishop not doing so much here. I went bishop c4 trying to potentially eye up this pawn on f7. Some ideas here that I was thinking even include knight g5, immediately aiming for that one, or even h3, kicking the knight on g4 away, and then knight e5, aiming for this weakness. You have to find weaknesses when you're attacking, um, when you're trying to play of initiative, always come up with concrete clan, plan, not clan, plan, and pick a target and aim to attack it. So this is my idea. I found a target. I aim to attack him. Now, if my opponent ever plays e6 straight away, his bishop on c8 becomes a dead piece. Not very good. So this is uh, going to offer me lots of compensation, I believe. Because how does he get his pieces out? How does he castle? Where does he castle? It's only a pawn. I must be doing okay. So he played very well. Bishop f5 first. I broke the pin of my knight with bishop d2. And also, some ideas have dis discovered attack with my knight on c3 now. My opponent played e6. I didn't see a good discovered attack with my knight. Now, there is a very funny trap here I I'd just like to show you guys. And that is, I've seen some people play in this similar position, something like knight to d7. Let's say queen e2. And now a move like g6. And it's a very well-known trap here. White to play and win. Can you see the winning idea? The winning idea is knight b5. And after something where the queen is attacked, like queen d8, this is this is a sexy move. Knight d6. Sexy checkmate. Boom. But of course, GMs generally don't fall for these things. So my opponent played e6. I played queen e2 anyway because I want a castle. And I was very happy with my position. I have pressure against e6. I have ideas and knight h4, this kind of stuff. My opponent moved his queen back now, so I've gained a lot of time here. And I think around here, I mean, I, I was a bit overconfident. 
The position is probably even, and it's exactly what you want for a gambited pawn. I've got more pieces developed. I've got two more pieces, well, three more if you include my queen. My opponent has to... I'm going to castle quickly, so his king is not safe yet. I maybe have an open g-file to attack on, and I always have to break d5 to play. So I have great compensation. Now, maybe I should have played d5 straight away. This was a move I, I should have possibly considered. Instead, I castle queenside. Very logical move, because I thought when I go d5, my, my rook is lined up against the queen, and it completes my development. Can't be a major mistake. Bishop e7. My opponent just trying to finish his development. And now, rook g1. I played this quickly. Maybe there are other options, but this seemed very natural. My idea now is h3 and rook takes g7. And it also tries to stop my opponent castling kingside because if he does, I play h3 and I have this, well, very powerful g file to attack along. And this is clearly worth a measly pawn to get such a position. So my opponent played the best move. He played very well in this game. g6, blocking the g file up. And now, well, I want to play d5, but it doesn't work yet. So bishop f4. Getting ready to break on through with d5. My opponent finishes development, knight d7, and now d5 comes. And around here, it's still very confident. My opponent was very short of time, and I had about 45 minutes. My opponent only had 10 minutes. Obviously, the, the opening had kind of mind messed him, should we say. And this idea is, I want to I open the position. Again, it's a very standard idea. If you have the initiative... If you have the better development, if you have the safer king, then you want to open up lines to get at your opponent's king, even if it costs you material. And this is trying to open up the e-file to get at his king. Goodbye, dear Derek. You have to also go and meet Gary in heaven, I'm afraid, dear sir. So now my opponent is, well, he has to take this pawn. This pawn is Derek is becoming too strong. So he played pawn takes d5, and now bishop takes d5. And the point of this move is, if black takes on d5, which I don't think he should do, it looks terribly dangerous, I go knight takes d5. Yes, I'm a whole piece down. My opponent can't really castle because I take on e7 with check and take on f5. I get my piece back with an attack. And I have horrible threats as simply rook e1, knight d4. Rook c8 is probably his best move, but now knight d4, and the pressure increases on his position. Knight takes f5, rook e1, it looks so dangerous. Even bishop d6 is coming with a major pin on the e-file. I mean, this is this is like this could be this could be a kill Kenny like waterfall all over his position here. So my opponent realized this and he played rook c8. Very good move. Now, my bishop, I think I played okay, back to b3. And I thought, well, I've opened up one line. I have ideas here of bishop a4, even trying to win this knight on d7. And other ideas, now I've moved Derek out of the way. It's a space clearance sacrifice as well. Often you want to sacrifice material to free up a square, clear a square. And now d4 is clear, and my knight wants to consider coming into that square to get rid of this knight bishop on f5. Other ideas when the knight comes to d4 is to sacrifice itself on e6 to break through my opponent's pawn chain over here on the king's side. So all of these ideas seem to be pretty, pretty useful. My opponent now played an excellent move. And this shows the kind of thing you should do when you're defending. Defending actively is always best if you can do that. He now plays a typical sacrifice, rook takes c3. This is a very normal move, you see it in the Sicilian a lot, and it opens up my king. b takes c3, and now he played queen a5. And I am now actually material up, but my opponent has got a little initiative. The queen is coming down, his bishop is coming over. And it's around this point I sunk into a deep fault. Now... I spent far too much time here and I kind of have to say I threw the game away, you know, in, in a minute or two. But this is a very interesting position. I actually, my first instinct, obviously I saw his plan of rook takes c3 and queen a5. My first instinct 
was to play rook takes d7 here. A counter, counter sacrifice to stop my opponent from castling. But I, after king takes d7, I couldn't see a good follow up here. I actually thought my opponent was quite safe because his king can run back and run away to g7. I wanted to play queen c4 to try and get my queen to c8 if he tries to run away. For example, king e8, queen c8 check. But after queen c4, I could not find a good solution to the move queen c5. And the endings are now bad for me because of my material. So this queen c5 move was a bit of a killer in that line. I was even spending a lot of time here on h3 and knight to e5 check. Couldn't find anything there. So I had to give up on rook takes d7. And this kind of shows you maybe the right thought processes, but it just didn't work today. And I was getting a bit muddled. So I was considering this move first. Now, the next move I was considering was aggressive ideas. I wanted to play queen to c4. And the idea here is to get queen to c8. He can't castle because my rook will take the knight. But I couldn't see a good move after knight c5 here. He brings another piece nearer my king, and he's just getting ready to castle. As soon as black castles, his king is going to be so well protected by this fortress of pawns in front of his king. And if you then compare his king to my king, which has had some shattered pawns, these double pawns here, I don't like my position. I'm, I also enjoy playing with the initiative, not defending. So I didn't want to, I didn't want to allow this either. So I'm really struggling here to think what to do. And I then came up with a plan. Okay, well, there's a lot of positions where he's going to go queen takes c3 and bishop a3 check. So king b1 seemed like a decent move to step out of these checks and just to wait and see. He still can't castle because if he does, I take on d7. And my plan here was if knight c5, I now was going to play knight to d4. And I thought, well, OK, if he castles in this position, it's totally different because I go knight takes f5 and he has a problem because he can't take with the e pawn because his bishop drops and he can't really take with a g pawn because I go h3, win a piece. So I'm just trying to stop him castling. So my opponent obviously saw this and he played an excellent move a la tempo. He played knight to f6. Brilliant move. This knight on g4 wasn't doing anything, and he's bringing it back around to defend its brother so he can castle and to bring it into the attack. Now I played a simply terrible move. Had I played a move like knight d4 here, which is my original intention anyway, and it shows you how my tournament wasn't working, anything was possible here. Any result possible, it would have been a very exciting game. But I blundered with knight to e5. And I was only looking at ideas of knight c5, knight d5. I totally missed, I'll be honest, how strong knight to e4 was. Um, and as soon as, he, as soon as I saw this move, it's one of those moments where I was a bit short of time. Your heart just sinks and you're like, yeah, didn't want to allow that one. Because the issue is he's threatening knight takes c3 and knight takes e5. Now, what was I thinking here? Well, my first thought was in this position to um, sack my queen. Queen takes e4 and knight takes d7 to stop him castling with ideas of bishop e5 and knight f6 check. But it, it, I've only got... It's not enough. My opponent would play queen f5 covering the f6 square and I'm really searching for any kind of compensation here. So I then saw, well, queen c4 is my best bet because... If he does take on e5, it's not so bad. I go bishop takes e5, and he can't go queen takes e5 because of queen c8 check, and I take on d8 with mate next move. So, very complex position, and queen c4 keeps me in the game. And another thing is, if he takes on c3 check, well, I can go king a1 maybe. And if he takes here, then again, there's ideas of queen c8 check, or just knight takes d7. Again, stopping and castling. My pieces coming into the game would check very soon. But my opponent, like I said, played absolutely brilliantly. He now played knight to c5. And look at his pieces. They're coming towards me. His king looks quite safe. And my king is looking more and more exposed. The threat here is just knight takes c3 check. But he's also now got ideas of knight takes b3. I try to confuse the issue because we're both short of time. And I quickly flicked in knight d7 
which is a confusing move. The idea is if knight takes d7, well, I have a lot of options, but maybe the main one is rook takes d7, and if king takes d7, queen d4 check, and I pick up the rook on h8, and I'm probably, well, I'm, I'm probably winning here. So still, a lot of ways my opponents go wrong, because this, this move could have thrown a less opponent, and he can't castle still. But he played excellently. Knight takes c3 check. I think I'm losing here. I tried king a1. And now my opponent played another brilliant move. The computer's first choice, b5. And phenomenal idea. And the point of this idea is, well, if he takes on b3 in the last position immediately, I have to play queen takes b3 in order to stop queen takes a2 checkmate. My queen defends a2. But if he goes b5, as he did in the game, if my queen moves away anywhere, let's say queen d4, well, now knight takes b3 check and queen takes a2 is going to lead to mate. So this was an excellent idea. And here, well, I'm really lost now. I try queen takes c5, still some tricks in the air. My opponent continued bishop takes c5. Knight was is my one idea is bishop here, knight to f6 check, trying to get my rook in. I'm a queen for a rook down. He still has to be a little bit accurate here. He still can't castle. He still has to be a bit careful. But he played with total aggression. Another brilliant move. Bishop takes c2. Fantastic. My bishop on b3 is the only piece defending against a checkmate on a2. So he tries to divert it away. Knight f6 check. Chaos is, is lurking. And if king e7, my rook comes in with check. This must be... Nearly okay for me. So king f8. Now I go have to go for a draw. Knight d7 check. King e7, another brilliant move. If he goes king g8 here, I may even have ideas of bishop takes e6. Look at this fantastic position. And madness everywhere. And now he has to be a little bit careful. For example, if he takes my rook, I take on g6. If he takes my bishop, well... Okay, maybe I can fight on with this check and my rook comes in, but it's still doubtful here, I have to admit. But he played the best move. He went king to e7, and after this move, I have some more spike checks. Check here, king e8, and now, well, because his queen defends against any mate on d8, I'm serious material down, and after rook d2, bishop takes b3, Bishop takes h8. One idea, knight to f6 check. So if he can, he can even here go wrong. For example, if he takes on a2, then I will go knight f6 check. And all of a sudden, it's probably a draw here because he can't escape my check. Well, maybe, maybe it's not even here, but I have some chances. But he played the best move. Why allow me any checks? And after bishop takes h8, he simply played, I think it was knight to d5. Knight to d5. Stops everything, and the only move I'm left to play here is to resign. But I have to say, it was a fascinating game, and you know these imaginative gambits—they're fun to play. I mean, I don't think—I don't think any other grandmaster has ever played um, this G4 move before. And the first grandmaster play, maybe the last, um, the Kill Kenny Gambit. And I have to thank the Irish guys for telling me about this because it led to a fascinating game, fascinating complications. Maybe not entirely sound, but it's also something that I think you can really surprise your opponents with. And I've gone through a little bit of basic theory there. You can see there's some positions where black has to tread with a great deal of care. So all in all, a very fun tournament. That's my little roundup of the game, of, of the competition. And I hope you enjoyed that video. Obviously, please like and please subscribe. I will do a major stream, but it might have to wait until early December because I've got so much work I need to catch up on now. But we're going to do a major 12-hour stream, a special event there for, for getting over 10,000 subscribers. And I just want to thank every one of you who subscribed to my channel. It's brilliant. Thank you so much for doing that. It's been a real, you know, real pleasure me doing, you know, having you guys support me. Thank you so much. And I think we're going to leave because that game was quite a psychedelic game. Let's leave this video with this psychedelic, psychedelic Williams picture. And I have to say, thank you so much for watching that video. Please like, please subscribe. And I'll be back again with more videos when I have some time. And yeah, 
Cheers. Enjoyed it. Check out Fiona's YouTube channel. Thank Fiona for the pictures. I'll be back again in no time at all. And also one last thank you. Thank you for Christoph for this um, amazing uh, piece of artwork he's created, which I think is brilliant. Goodbye for now. <laughs>